um, has been a librarian with the Vancouver Public Library um, for a long time when language learning audio cassettes and Shakespeare were on VHS, where, um, uh, were avant-garde materials in a public library. Now, some of Stephanie's new uh, roles with VPN, uh, VPL have included project manager for the um, pilot First Nations Storyteller in Residence program, a branch head of Carnegie Library, and coordinator of accessible services. She is presently ahead of the Nekaxmat uh, Strathcona branch, and I will have butchered that, I apologize, and looks forward to once again working in and with the downtown east side community uh, when this new branch opens in early 2017. And so uh, let's all welcome uh, Stephanie. Thank you. How's the sound out there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, your pronunciation of Natsumats was not great, but <laughs> neither is mine, um, and we are working on that. Uh, we'll get along with that. So thank you. One of the reasons, well, I think the main reason I was invited here today is uh, was primarily to talk about the new branch that will be opening, because it does have a number of firsts in it about public library services. And, um, and to talk a little bit more about one of the community digital art projects that's associated with the branch. I will also sprinkle in some other things about how the public library in general tries to support media democracy, um, but mainly that should be it. I didn't bring a time thing, so flag me if it's really, really rambling. Um, that's great, so thank you, I'll move on. Uh, the new branch, will be um, the first time in North America, as far as we know, where affordable housing was done collaboratively with the public library space from the beginning. So we actually are a full-fledged partner with the YWCA on this project. There are 21 units of housing for low-income, at-risk single mothers. They'll be on the upper floors with the library on the bottom. There are other buildings where housing is above a library, but they weren't designed that way as collaborative space. It's just that the library might lease or rent the bottom floor and then there's apartments above. So we're pretty sure that's a North America first. And I think this has been in the making for many, many years. If it wasn't, I think we would have found out by now. Um, there will be a lot of family and community programming space. And in terms of size, it'll be the first time that the downtown east side Strathcona community has had elbow room. Uh, they have had public library service through Carnegie Branch and the old Strathcona Library that we now closed. Uh, but both of those, if you've been in there, are really small. They're awesome libraries, but super tiny. This new Natsumat Strathcona will be the equivalent of five and a half Carnegie Libraries in terms of size. So we're pretty excited about that for the community. They've needed it for decades. And it's opening in early 2017. Um, these, as soon as we can give a date, we will. Uh, so a little bit more about the branch name. Uh, Natsumats is the Hunkaminam language, which is uh, primarily spoken around um, the Coast Salish people of this land area. And uh, it was one of among well over 400 types of submissions that we had asked the community, when we get this new branch, what should we call it? Um, we had been vaguely saying, you know, the new downtown east side Strathcona branch, but at some point it needed a name. And out of over 400 submissions and some fairly long community processes and consultations with First Nations, um, the phrase nuts and nuts, Strathcona, so the two names are together, we don't separate them. Uh, Strathcona to acknowledge the historic neighborhood, and Natsumats means we are one in Kukumina. And that would be a first, again, uh, so another one of the firsts for that branch is that it's the first government building, civic building, to have an official Aboriginal name, uh, including in the Aboriginal script. Um, another first is that it will um, have digital creation space. Some of you, if you use the Central Library downtown, you might already know about the Inspiration Lab that opened a couple years ago. And that's where 
person can come and create space. And I'm picking up here now on something Melissa said, where um, the libraries where you come to partake of the information that's already there. And that's absolutely true. And it's one of the changes the public library's really gradually been shifting and shifting. And we're doing more of allowing, you know, trying to facilitate people coming in and creating instead of just partaking. And that's, I think, a really big difference that digital media has made more possible for people to not just come in and consume what we've already got in the library, but create their own, whether they share it or not, uh, create their own and possibly add it to our collection, or use it as a way to bring people in and, um, and do more. So there will still be partaking, but there will also be creation. And uh, the Bud Osborne Creation Space at Natsumat Strathcona will be the first time we offer that in a neighborhood branch instead of all the cool, exciting things being at Central. Um, more detail about what's in that creation space. Uh, software that people wouldn't normally have at home unless they do this kind of thing for a living or um, you know, specialize in it. Uh, including two sound recording booths and so, uh, sound editing equipment. And every time I talk about um, the sound recording booths in the community, I get um, people saying, oh, that's awesome, I would use it for X, I would use it for Y. Uh, I'm really, really excited and curious to see how those sounds become used. Um, quite often, it's come up that, well, it would be a great resource in the downtown east side for people to capture um, the indigenous language, maybe that their auntie or uncle speaks, whatever's left of it, and have a conversation, record some things, and then use it for their own language learning tools. So for sure, capturing language, language learning would be awesome. Um, people do spoken word poetry, music, there's enough room to bring the guitar in with. Uh, interviews, um, someone else from the Thursday Writing Collective said to me that um, older people have so much history and experience to share, they want to write their stories, but the actual act of writing them down is really tedious and, and difficult and challenging for some people, and to capture those stories perhaps in an interview format where they can just talk in a sound booth and then use the equipment. So I think there will be some pretty awesome creation coming out of that, and we will be sensitive to whether or not it can be shared, or is it just for the person's own use. And the Community Digital Artist Project is another first. Uh, the public library has never done anything quite like this. Um, a jury of community members selected Lisa G. Nielsen to work with us to generate more awareness that the branch is opening and that the branch will have digital creation space. And her proposal that was so simple and yet so elegant and lovely is uh, she captures on audio and or video or photos, however people are comfortable, working with people to, as they try to learn to pronounce the word Matsumat. <coughs> so you can see how that makes perfect sense. And not just their pronunciation of it, but the meaning of it. So it, a little perspective on the meaning. I, we fling out the phrase, we are one, because that's simple and that captures it. But it was, uh, it was only after a lot of conversations I'd had with other indigenous people that I was able to broaden my own view of we are one. So at first I thought, yeah, perfect for public library. We are one, everyone's welcome, it's a shared space. That's good, but I was just thinking of people. And really the, the concept of we are one in the indigenous framework is not just the people here in Vancouver, all people, brothers and sisters, it's also animals, it's the trees, it's the waterways. If there's an affected body of water somewhere else on the planet, then we are all one, we are all connected. Somewhere else there's going to be an effect Right? So it's anything that has to do with life, we're all one, and the impacts are very global, and it's a much, much broader concept than at first I was just thinking you know, library-centrically about it. So people talk about that, what the concept means to them, 
And then they're also invited to share if they know another language and if their language has an equivalent phrase, uh, somewhat like we are one, then they share that in their language. And, uh, and that's also really interesting. You'll notice it took me three sentences to describe it in English as opposed to Natsumas, which is one concept. So some languages will have one brief word that comes close or means the same thing, and others say, well, I can explain it in a sentence or two. So that's been really super interesting. When Lisa has finished collecting all the people's versions and their learning and their stories from that, she'll edit it into a final piece, however it makes sense to her artistically, and that'll be displayed on a large digital screen in the branch. So people come to visit from the community, they might see a snippet of themselves or someone they know or someone they see in that shop up the street, um, all talking about what we are one means to them. And I am totally looking forward to seeing the end result of that. If, um, if you're interested in being part of Lisa's project, she's not totally finished, you can get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with Lisa and she'd be happy to get some recordings. Uh, also, as part of this, what we've got scheduled but hasn't happened yet is both Lisa and myself will be having some more, uh, shall we call it tutoring, uh, language support from Hunkamina speakers at the Musqueam Cultural Center so that when we're with the community and working with people, we get some feedback about how we're saying it. So I've had informal feedback that's gotten me closer, and I'm probably running out of time, but they're beautiful images, and as I said, I'll digitize them now. Oh, Coding Buddies is, uh, this was a pilot program, uh, and it was uh, super successful in 2016, so plans for 2017 is to nearly double it. The, this is a program where, as I said, teens are helping younger children to develop apps. And why this is important is um, things like coding and the tech skills are now built into the new curriculum for elementary school kids. And if they can only work on it in school because they don't have access to lots of devices and solid internet connections at home, then their peers who do have those gadgets at home will get further ahead because they can practice at home and do more homework. Uh, the ones without can only work on it during school hours. So if you can think back to more like a 1970s style education or even the 80s, anyone could practice their homework if they wanted to, uh, if it was say spelling and math and whatnot. Uh, you could do it orally at home, you could do it on any scrap of paper at home with your notebook. You didn't need an iPad, you didn't need an internet connection. Uh, you didn't have issues today where low-income families might all be sharing one laptop among four or five people, all of whom have homework or work to do or resumes to prepare and things like that. So there were over a hundred um, teens and children involved in it in 2016 and they figure it'll be close to double for 2017. And uh, finally another way of trying to bridge the digital divide. Um, a pop-up tech cafe in Oppenheimer Park. That's uh, every Friday. It's the closest we can get to low barrier access to technology help. Uh, we don't like to think in terms of no barrier because there's probably always something, uh, but it's getting pretty close. So it's right in Oppenheimer Park uh, with an array of gadgets, but people bring their own gadget or just ask their question. They don't have to register, they don't need a library card, they don't need ID, they don't necessarily even have to have a question. They can just come by and say, whoa, so that's what an iPhone looks like. <laughs> uh, so mostly they bring their own devices and ask the questions about that. You will uh, have noticed that in all of those, actually I'm going back one slide, if you can peer at the very bottom of that, you can see the logos of four things. Just as a sort of summary, I want to emphasize that almost everything we do that's really cool involves another community partner. It's not something we cooked up by ourselves in the library with our little archival subject headings. <laughs> uh, it's through 
you know, listening to people in the community and working with them. Uh, so the four logos on this one, there's ourselves, the Vancouver Public Library, UBC Learning Exchange, the red and blue one is the Downtown Eastside Literacy Roundtable, and then in the far corner is the Carnegie Community Center. Um, the quilt digitization that it mentioned, the organization there, uh, Lisa's digital media project, it was related to our branch, but our branch isn't open, so she needed physical space to meet people, work with people, set up her recording equipment. Um, the Atira Women's Housing Society with their um, Enterprising Women Making Art space was a great partner. Strathcona Community Center, McLean Park, and um, UBC Learning Exchange. The, the, all these kinds of partners uh, help make these things awesome. Is that one key? I am going back to the last screen in case anyone wants to write that down. And thank you very much. Thank you.